idea. Joey knows this. Called Geek World All Stars. The idea was to bring together a group of remarkable podcasts. See if they could become something more. See if they could work together when we needed them to. To cast the pods, we never could. Follow us at stars underscore geek on Twitter and stay tuned for more. Welcome to the continued podcast adventures of Superhero Speak. But I think many of the people that love this character and that love superheroes in general have used these stories as inspiration to say, you know what, I'm going to do something good in the world. I'm going to make a difference like my hero when I was a kid. That is my fondest memory of it because when, you, when you're doing comic books, you want them to affect people, right? You want people to care. You want, you want to strike emotions. And I knew that that clone saga was striking a lot of emotions. Can you yeah. imagine Pulp Fiction starring Goofy and Mickey Mouse? I can totally <laughs> imagine that. I'm Don't sure look, somebody's written that one too. Pounder with cheese and France, Mickey. <laughs> what? <laughs> the boy with cheese, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally see. I, I, would, I would watch the hell out of that movie. Yes, I gladly saw sacrifice that my, my progeny to you, a mighty Marvel beast. <laughs> <laughs> But Neil Adams is somewhere going, hmm, it's, uh, it's my time. Uh, <laughs> How do you measure success? Hey, everyone. You're listening to Superhero Speak. I'm your host, Dave. And John. J.D. And uh, this week, J.D. brought a straggler with him. I mean... It's what I do. Uh, brought a special guest with him this week. Uh, he is here to talk about his book, um, Road of Bones, and of course, it's the one and only Rich Dueck. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Eh, hanging in there. It's a Monday, you know. Yeah. Didn't have any exciting movies to watch this weekend. It was all last weekend. <laughs> I'm still recovering. I was I was going to say, yeah, yeah, about your book, but what we really want to know is what you thought of Game of Thrones and Endgame. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> We're not allowed to talk about Game of Thrones, remember, John? It's, we, we're not allowed to talk about last night's episode, but they've had a whole week for the la- for the one Stop. before that. Who's they? Me. Me, he me, wants, me, me, me. He Stop. wants to binge it at the end. You, you gotta respect them. <laughs> no, that, that I can respect, yeah. Because that's that basically. The last time you guys did this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it I'm again. A, I'm, a, I'm a binger at the end for Game of Thrones also. Thank so you. Thank you, sir. Don't I really appreciate have it. That. <laughs> Don't have an opinion on that. Uh, I feel bad for everyone who's upset at the way things are developing, but I thought the, the Starbucks cup was hilarious. I um, I saw that. <laughs> You're sitting there like, wait, did I just wait? <laughs> I didn't know Westeros had been invaded by Starbucks. I mean, mm-hmm. they're everywhere. I, I, I'm, I just, surpri- I'm surprised Starbucks didn't make a bigger deal out of it. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Like, uh, hey, we opened our first franchise in Westeros. Like, <laughs> Br- <laughs> brilliant, Landing. it's brilliant underhanded viral marketing if it was done on purpose. Yeah, right. Yeah, I don't. That's a good question. Like, everyone's making such a big deal about it, and, but I do wonder how do you miss something like that in the chaos of some of those scenes? You're kidding me. I'm surprised you you don't catch one of them with an iPhone in their hand or a Sony <laughs> laptop up on one of the tables. Well, I'm just saying, there's somebody's job who it is to dress the set, right? And mm-hmm. I would mm-hmm. think, and and they also happen to work for Starbucks. Oh, <laughs> is, that, is that how that works? I mean, it's weird. It's weird that nobody caught it in like editing and like didn't like digitally paint it out or something, but. Yeah, I guess it's just one of those things that like slip through the cracks. That is crazy that no one caught it in the editing. But yeah. I don't think about it. Yeah, I mean, especially on your last season, it's, you know, because mm-hmm. everything's coming to a head. You know, you're going to have the most people watching this season to see how it all ends. And, Checks them in cash, man. No one cares anymore. <laughs> 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 is that how it really works, JD? For me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cool, cool. So, um, yeah. Rich, well, I guess we'll start with you here. Um, so one question that we always kind of ask, um, 
anyone who's on the show who's an art, artist or a writer or whatnot, um, is writing something you've always wanted to do and have you always wanted to work in comics? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I wanted, I mean, like, I, I, I've, I've been a comic reader since I was like, since I was like learning to read. Like, I remember being like, uh, like seven or eight or something. And, you know, back then there were comics on like newsstands and like candy stores. And I just mm-hmm. remember like, that was like the highlight of my weekend was like when I would go, we would like go out shopping with the family or whatever. And we'd like stop in the candy store and, like, uh, my dad and my grandfather would give me like, like five bucks or something and I would, could go like just grab a bunch of comics. So, you know, when I was really young, it's like, you know, it just sort of like became part of my, like, um, you know, introduction to reading and like storytelling and like there's stuff I remember from like certain issues back then. Like I can like, like literally like, like panel to panel and page to page, like how things went. So there's just like something about it that really struck a chord with me. Um, as far as writing goes, like, uh, I've, I've, yeah, I've always wanted to be a writer. Like, I think probably as far back as when I realized like, uh, writing was like a thing you could do. Like, you know, I think mm-hmm. like kind of like, cause like when you're, I think like when you're a kid, you know, like I never really kind of thought about like, you know, like oh there's people out there writing these books you know like like it was always just like oh this is this is fun book or whatever and like you know there's like an author but you know once i kind of realized like there's like people whose you know job it is to like sort of come up with these stories it's something i want i wanted to do and i think um i wasn't necessarily like when when i started writing i wasn't necessarily thinking like oh i want to write comics but I know it was always like kind of in the back of my head is like something I wanted to do. Mm. And, um, I was, I was definitely one of those, uh, like sort of like a frustrated novel writer where like I would like, uh, I would have an idea for a story and I would start and I would get about like, I don't know, five, 10,000 words in and just sort of be like, I'm completely exhausted and I don't know what to do. <laughs> and I would abandon it and then I would start another one. And this was just sort of like a cycle. And then, uh, you know, I took, um, a, a comics writing class because I was interested in like kind of learning how to do scripts as opposed to writing prose. And, uh, this is a, a comics experience that, you know, JD, uh, is familiar with also. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, the class project was like a five page script, right? So like a five page trip, that's like doable, you know, <laughs> like I did the class project and it was done and I was like, okay, it's done. Like I finished something finally, uh, and it's a comic script. So let me see if I can get an artist to illustrate it. Uh, so it took a little while to find one, but I did find a guy and, uh, you know, showed him the script, we talked about it, he was into it. And then once I got the art, like in my inbox, I was like, yes. <laughs> this is what I want to do from now on. <laughs> it just kind of went from there, you know, just kind of, I uh, did a few more short stories to just kind of, uh, get my feet under me and then just started writing longer stuff. Right. So, so I'm kind of curious, um, when you say a five page script, does that, mm-hmm. does that become a, you know, a 22, 24 page comic or is that five pages of comic? Yeah, no, it was five pages of comic. Like, okay. uh, it was like, um, you know, the goal of the project was just to do like a short self-contained story, beginning, mm-hmm. middle and end. Um, and then, uh, I mean, like the ideas in that short comic that I did, like, like it was like a five page story and it was, uh, it was called gutter magic. And that was kind of like, five page story that inspired my first mini series. I kind of took the characters from that story and then expanded on it more and like blew it out into like a longer thing. But the actual thing, it was like, I think script wise, it might've been like six or seven pages of script just because, you know, when you sometimes when you write like long descriptions or dialogue or something, things can go over, but it it was like literally just like five, like five pages of comic the the thought being that if you can't write a five page story, you can't write a twenty two page story later. 
It's right. a great ex- it's a great exercise, and it's I'm sure Rich will agree with me on this. It's super challenging when you first yeah. do it to try to write a five page story. Like it sounds easy, but it's way tougher than you'd expect. You kind of have to like boil it down to like what's really essential because you're not like it's like you don't have the the space to like waste, you know, to sort of like meander around. Like you, so you really kind of have to hone in on like what it is about your story that you want to tell and, and, you know, you're kind of like, it's like a very lean story, you know? So, so no spending two pages of Robert Jordan description on a leaf. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, or like to bring it back to, to bring it back to George, uh, George R. R. Martin and Song of Ice and Fire. Like, you know, you're not like, well, you know, when somebody rides into a camp, you're not going to be describing in detail every single banner and the mm-hmm. lineage of every horse and, and, you know, things like that. So, <laughs> so you know, and I, I, like there's a place for that, you know, like that works really well in novels and people really like that. But like, I think even in prose, like the shorter you get, the more you kind of have to pare away like the non-essential stuff and really kind of focus on like your storytelling. And I think that's why it's like a valuable exercise because you kind of, you get to see like what's important and what's not. Right. Cool. I mean, I never like, thought about that. That's actually, that's really yeah. cool. I mean, like one interesting thing with, uh, with Gutter Magic, the series was, it was originally, like originally, originally I planned it out to be six issues mm-hmm. and then, and then I had planned it to be five issues just because I was going through. And then, uh, when I was talking with Andy and the publishers and stuff, you know, what they were saying was that, you know, the way it tends to work with issues is like every, every issue of like a mini series, you kind of order like stores order less and less of it. So you kind of like make back like a little bit less and a little bit less with every issue. Mm-hmm. Cause some people, you know, just people might buy a first issue to be, cause they're interested and then they'll kind of fall off and just, you know, or just not keep up with it. So anyway, so there, so in these discussions, they were just saying like, well, you know, if you do five issues, probably issue five, you're going to be in the red. Like it's probably not going to make back, uh, you know, what you put into it. So you might want to consider going to four. And at first I was really bummed out because I was like, you know, there's some stuff I've already have written and like, I really kind of liked how it's going. Uh, so like to lose like an entire issue's worth of material, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do it. But then I just sort of sat down and I was like, all right, let me just see how it might work. Right. And I rewrote a lot of it and I just sort of realized I was like, wow, like it's kind of moving at like a really nice pace now. There's no like, there's no fat on this story. Like it's, it's like lean and like it's like humming. Like, you know, like I was really kind of feel like it was, uh, almost like a stronger story for mm-hmm. having like gone through and like trimming all the fat from it. So that was really enlightening too. Like kind of um, just sort of being able to let go of some things that I really liked, but that maybe weren't, uh, you know, kind of pulling their weight in terms of like what needed to be told. Right. Cool. I, I, that sounds like good advice for any writer to like, Go mm-hmm. back over something they've written and say, "What don't I need?" Mm-hmm. But but don't do it while you're still writing it. That, <laughs> that's that's the thing I've taken away from a lot of people we've talked to. Like self editing yeah. is like the worst thing you can do. No, yeah, I mean, like if if at all if at all possible, like I think what you want to do is you want to just sort of finish a draft. You know, like they say. I've even seen some writers call it like a first draft, they call it like a vomit draft because you're just sort of <laughs> vomiting it all out. And, uh, and then later you're going to clean it up, you know? <laughs> so it's like finish the draft, then go through and then edit. But yeah, it's like, I think if you kind of edit as you go, you can kind of fall into the trap of like getting stuck on a certain part and you're just going to go over it and over it and over it and never finish. So I think like kind of like finishing and just sort of that feeling of like typing the end even if you know you're going to go back and rewrite like almost the entire thing it's like super valuable to just sort of learn how to do that to like be able to just sort of push through and finish the draft no matter what 
One thing I think that's underrated is people always complain about rewrites, but I think rewriting is easier than actually like writing the first draft. Writing the first draft is tough, but once you have something mm-hmm. down, it's much easier to go back and go, okay, this works, this doesn't. Mm-hmm. And it's, fixing is much easier than building. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, yeah. very true. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, and, and I mean, and some, sometimes it's like you, you know, you sort of may realize that you took a wrong turn and like you have a lot, a lot of rewriting to do. And then like other times you, you know, it might just be a couple of tweaks, but you know, kind of like, I think once you get over the idea that like everything you have to put down, like has to be perfect the second, you know, it leaves your fingertips, I think you, you kind of like seriously like level up like as a writer. It just makes it so much easier when you, when you just sort of realize that, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Nobody has to see it, you know, until you feel comfortable showing it to somebody. But like, you know, it's like, it's, it's like kind of work to get it to the point where you need to get it to. Like, it's not going to always like, uh, sort of flow out of you like um you know like it's coming from like the muse or something like that you know yeah don't be afraid to be bad because you yeah, can always fix exactly it. exactly like one thing that um i i heard recently from uh that like neil gaiman said that i thought was like just like utterly brilliant was he was like you know you're you're working on like let's say like a story and like it's like there's going to be some pages that you like that fl- flowed out of you like like water. Like it was like the easiest thing in the world. You got on like a tear and you were just like writing like like a man possessed. And then there are going to be other pages mm-hmm. that you, sh- you struggle over and like you beat yourself up over that they're not working. And it's, it's like you're, it's like pulling teeth to get them out there. And it was like, but at the end of the day, the person reading is not going to have any idea which page is which. <laughs> it's like, you know, they're just reading it, right. you know? So it's like, yeah, I don't know. There's just something about that I thought was, like, really, uh, really nice, like, thought. That just, like, you know, you don't have to, like, kind of beat yourself up if, like, you're kind of, like, struggling through something. Right. Well, speaking of, of stuff that was probably brilliant the moment it came out of you, uh, why don't you <laughs> give the listeners the uh, elevator pitch for Road of Bones? Okay. So, um... So Road of Bones is the story of this guy named Roman who is uh, imprisoned in the Soviet gulag uh, in the 1950s. Uh, he's basically, you know, he told a uh, bad joke about uh, Stalin and got sentenced to 20 years, which mm. is something that really happened. 20 years of hard labor in, in Siberia, which is insane. Uh, mm. And, you know, it basically... He's being like basically like worked to death, like at this prison camp, and he gets a chance to uh, to escape. Only uh, these two prisoners invite him along, and the only problem is is that for any chance at freedom, they basically have to cross this mountain range uh, in the freezing cold of like some of the most forbidding terrain on Earth, and. Um, they have very little food, very little equipment, uh, and it's just an ordeal of like survival to like get out of there. And to make things even more complicated, uh, Roman sort of has this, uh, creature called a Domovic who he kind of sees as a guardian angel, uh, but he's not really sure if, if it's a real, uh, real creature that, you know, of the kind his grandmother used to tell him about in fairy tales, or if he's just going crazy from being in uh, captivity um, and being in, in like such an extreme situation. So he kind of thinks this thing is looking out for him and warning him about dangers along the way, but you know, we're never sure whether it has more sinister intentions or not. It's like alive, the movie alive with mm-hmm. everyone hates each other and a little monster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Um like I, I'm lucky enough I got to read the original like screenplay version of this, which sent to me a year or two ago, 
and I loved it back then. And I just said, um, today I want to make sure it's nice and fresh. So I got to read both issues of Road to Bones. And, man, it was fun kind of reliving this. And I, I absolutely love what, what Alex Cormick's done with the art. Like, it's so mm-hmm. ugly and, and visceral. Like, it's it's perfect for this book. Yeah, there is not there is not one, like, pretty character in the entire book. They're all, like, you know, scarred and, like, warty and dirty. And I just think it's great because, you know, it really kind of brings across that feeling of, like, uh, that like these prison camps were like really kind of like hell on earth. Like, um, so yeah, I, I think Alex did an amazing, amazing job of, of taking the script and just sort of building this atmosphere of like dread. Like I look at the pages and it's like, it's like, I know what's going to happen. And I sort of like feel like this like dread and despair, like as I'm looking at like the art. So, you know. so JD, did you send Rich pictures of me and John for inspiration? Is that... No, no, <laughs> no. This is before. This is Wait, before which that. one of us? Which one of us would be the monster? That's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so, like Alex Cormack, I think is he's kind of an unsung hero, but I think he's probably the best horror artist in comics. Like a lot of his work is is very horror is, ba- is very horror based. He did Sink. He did and Emily is Gone. Like sc- legit scary books. And I don't think that people have really taken to him on a mainstream level yet, but I think this is the book that's really kind of going to be his coming out party, because this really shows just how damn good Alex is. Yeah, he, he's amazing. Alex is really, really great at, like, I, I mean, like, he's really, really great just in general, but I think two things that, like, he really excels in is sort of, like, uh, creating, like, an atmosphere of uh, fear and, like, unease Whereas, like, you're kind of reading it and you can almost, like, feel something coming and it just, like, feels like, you know, when it needs to feel, like, oppressive, it feels oppressive when there's, like, you know, going to be, like, a good reveal. Like, like he, he does, like, he, you know, he's great at kind of, like, spacing out those moments. And he's also really great at, like, having, like, really expressive, like, faces. Like, like his characters really, like, act. You know what I mean? Like, there's mm-hmm. not there's no like kind of like blank faces like you know everybody is kind of like everybody draws like like uh i could say to him like in in the script or something i could be like well so and so is smiling but like you know we kind of see a hint of uh um menace like in his eyes and that's like something really subtle like that's something that like might be you know easy for like an actor and like a film to do you mm-hmm. know what i mean yeah but when somebody's drawing it's like you know not every artist can really kind of pull that off you know like you know some people like, like facial expressions like the, the, you know they could do the basic ones or something but it's hard to get like that kind of like nuance across but that's one thing alex like does beautifully is like kind of like uh, like I've never seen smiles as terrifying as he draws smiles in this book <laughs> from like a couple of different characters. It's like, you know, like you see somebody smiling and you're like, Oh, this is like a wolf smiling. Like, <laughs> you know, right. His work, his work is moody. Like it does a mm-hmm. great job yeah. setting the mood for what's going on. Like, like I said, as far as like a pure horror artist goes, he's awesome. And like, I'm, I'm excited that you guys got IDW on board with this because mm-hmm. man, it's a, cra- it's a crazy idea. It's, it's very unique to what's going on. I think in, in a lot of comics right now is that like, it's this small, like it's almost like an independent horror movie in terms mm-hmm. of like, there's not a lot of characters. It's a very, it's a sp- sparse setting. Mm-hmm. And like it, it, it's like I said, like a lot of stuff in comics is this big bombasting kind of stuff, kind of like Wailing Blade, which I'll get to in a minute. Whereas <laughs> this is like so stripped down and yeah. raw. It's cool. Yeah. I, I I can't say enough good things about this book. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, raw is an interesting, uh, <laughs> an interesting uh, descriptor for considering. Let's see what I did there? Be, Yeah. <laughs> so, so how did you and um, uh, how did you and Alex uh, get together on this project? That 
Well, I've known Alex for like a few years because um, there's this uh, smaller publisher called Comics Tribe. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm really friendly with um, one of the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friendly with, with the, uh, the owner, but also um, Joe Mulvey, who's my artist on um, on Wailing Blade, is pretty, like he did his first book of Comics Tribe. And just like over the years, like, you know, like Joe is, you know, one of my uh, best friends that I made, uh, doing comics. And, and I just kind of like, you know, every, every year when I go to cons, it's like the comic tribes guys are there. That's like who I'm hanging out with. And, uh, Alex has been doing work for them, a lot of work for them too. He started out doing, um, uh, working on this, uh, book called Oxymoron with them. And then as JD mentioned before, he was, he was working on this book, uh, called Sync written by John Lees, who's another really, really talented, horror writer um sync is kind of like this uh crazy anthology of like uh it's almost like this um it's about a slum in scotland where like uh in in glasgow scotland where like all these like fucked up things happen like you know there's like a uh a van full a blue van full of clowns that like kidnap people and mutilate them and stuff like that and it's basically, it's like an anthology series. Like each story is like self-contained, but, uh, they all kind of like tie together a little bit. And it's just like a plus horror. And Alex is the artist on that. So like I'm looking at sync and I'm reading it like every month as it comes out. And I'm just like, you know, I think Alex would be great, great for road bones because again, it was just sort of like looking at that and kind of just seeing what he was creating there in terms of like, you know, the setting and the atmosphere and how he was like drawing things. I was just like, I think he would be really, really good. So, um, so we were, I knew we were going to meet up at New York Comic Con, um, two years ago. And I was just like, Hey, I got this project. Um, you know, we'll talk about it in person, but, you know, but I sent him the script. And he kind of sat with the script for a little bit, did a few like concepts and stuff, and he really, really liked it. So we just decided like, yeah, like, let's do it. Um, so, you know, he, he, uh, threw a cover together, did a few sample pages. Um, we started chopping that around and IDW picked us up and then it was off to the races. Yeah. That, it, it's funny mm-hmm. cause, uh, a JD mentioned how this, is different than a lot of stuff that's out there and, and the sparseness. And um I'm just flipping through it as we're talking and like there's, there's panels of just um there is, you know, it's, it's night and they're obviously escaping and they're at a mm. uh, barbed wire fence. And all it is is two hands and the barbed wire, which mm-hmm. is a very sparse picture, but yet he makes it an interesting image. Mm-hmm. Which is very hard to do. Yeah. It's extremely hard. And, 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 and it's like, it's like even like the quiet moments, like he does like a great job with like kind of infusing them with like some tension. Like, I think like not so much in like the first issue, but in like some of the later issues, it's like they're sort of like trekking across the tundra. And I, I really kind of wanted to get across the idea that like, you know, it's like when it's like, just three people and you're like hiking for days and weeks. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's going to be times where like, just nobody says a freaking word to each other. You know what I mean? So we've right. got kind of sequences where they're just sort of like trudging over the mountains and there's like, you know, kind of like a, a break in the dialogue. And, you know, he just does a great job of like kind of getting that tension across even without any words and like, you know, getting the passage of time across, like, you know, we'll have like panels that go from like light to sunset to light again, just to sort of, you know, kind of get that, that feeling. And I, I think, you know, it's just, that's like definitely something he knocked out of the park is just kind of like, not only like he delivers on like the kind of big action moments where he needs to, but he also delivers on like just the really quiet, quiet stuff as well yes so rich where did you come up with this idea i mean to ask this like two years now but (laughs) how did how did this how did you think of this like is do you have like russian family background like i knew nothing of like the Mm -hmm. i still can't even pronounce it the the monster thing Um, oh the domovic yeah yeah i I can never say that Uh, where did that come from well 
I do have I do have Russian family like on, on my grandfather's side and like you know it's sort of like little folk tales like that like like the Dolmovic I think it's it's not even something that like my grandparents probably believed but it's stuff that like maybe their grandparents believed and told them when they were kids and it just sort of like filtered down like here and there but it wasn't anything like not like a super huge like part of my life growing up or anything um but like the idea for this just came where i uh i was basically researching uh prison escapes for uh like a completely different project that um i might not even like go back to it was like uh you know the idea wasn't as good as road phones <laughs> but um but anyway i was just sort of like looking at prison escapes in general and uh i started reading about the gulag and and like uh what life was like there and the more i read the more i was like wow this is this is really interesting and i can't believe uh nobody's really kind of put two and two together and, and set a story you know in the setting and like i know there have been a couple of you know stories that like like touched on it like there was there was there was some guy who's like a um i think he was like a polish prisoner of the gulag and he escaped along with like a few people and they walked all the way across the himalayas and it was like a movie in the 70s or something so i knew about that but i was like nobody's really kind of touched on this um you know nobody's really kind of done like a like a prison escape story like in, in the way that like i wanted to do it mm-hmm. so it was really just like doing research because a lot of stuff in the book is like stuff that uh you know kind of actually happened like out of context like it took bits and pieces here and there but there's things like you know like you really you know in stalin's russia like you know you tell the wrong joke at a party and somebody overhears it you could go to prison for 10 years 20 years and not like you know cushy federal prison like you know (laughs) you're going to siberia and you're you're going to be worked basically to death because you know it's like a 10-year sentence but the life expectancy of being there was like something around six months and there were these like prison gangs and they did go to war with each other and things like that you know like all the stuff uh with um the uh there's two groups in prison uh in the prison in Rotobones. there's the uh the vor which is a real organization if you've ever seen eastern promises like that's what that was all about and then there was this other faction called suka uh who were vor who kind of cut deals with the russian government to go fight in world war ii and then when they got back to the prisons they got they had reduced sentences uh, and the two factions were fighting and it was literally called, I'm not making this up. I'm not being sexist. It was literally called the bitch wars. Like go on Wikipedia, look up the bitch wars. It was a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's like, I just find stuff like that fascinating. And, uh, and I just wanted to like incorporate some of that into the story I wanted to tell. But I also, you know, I'm, I'm like, my roots are kind of like in science fiction, fantasy, folklore. I love stuff like that. So I didn't want it to just, I, I just didn't want it to be like, just like kind of like a straight up prison story. I wanted to have like some kind of like supernatural, like horror, horror element to it as well. Cause I love like psychological horror and I love like kind of the type of horror that's like kind of keeping you guessing like the whole way through. Right. Just whether it's real or whether it's just somebody going slowly going insane uh, oh, elevated yeah. horror is the new term actually so what is it elevated, elevated horror? horror yeah elevated. that's what they're called right. yes i heard that recently on a podcast all right yeah. well if we qualify if it sounds good <laughs> <laughs> it's funny too because like one of the things that appealed to me about um the x-files when it first came out was for the longest time you didn't know if Mulder was um, crazy or if there really were mm-hmm. aliens, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and it's funny because I always say this to people, like, I stopped watching you after the movie because there it was right out in front of you. You're like, yep, yeah, there <laughs> right. were aliens all along. It was like, 
Well, that ruins the, the, the fun of, like, is it real or not? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, um, so I'm kind of curious, uh, we, going back to something you said earlier about, uh, getting into comics when you were a kid and, uh, how it helped you to learn to read. And then, mm-hmm. of course, getting to that point where you realize, like, oh, somebody writes this, you know, and that, mm-hmm. that's, that's a job. Can you remember, like, what point you realized that with comics and, like, who were some of the right? Like, did that make you float towards different writers as opposed to just different characters? Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess it's weird. Like with comics, like I read them all through, all through high school, Mm -hmm. all through, um, and then like probably like midway through college. And then like when I was in college, it was sort of like, um, you know, I I would kind of like, I would see them and like, you know, sort of like, I would go to like, I was, I was sort of like more into like gaming, weirdly enough. So like, uh, you know, I would kind of like see comics, but I wasn't, I kind of like fell out of it for a couple of years. Mm. And then, uh, then when I was back from college and back in New York, um, I started, uh, I, I would go to, um, Forbidden Planet, um, in the village cause they, they sold, uh, a lot of gaming stuff. Like I was into, I don't know if you guys know what uh, Warhammer is. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was like, I was super, I was super into Warhammer and like, uh, that was like, you know, I was like paint stuff and I would play and and like, uh, you know, Forbidden Planet at the time had like a gaming section where they sold a lot of Warhammer stuff. And sometimes I would just go there to like, just see what was new. And then I just kind of browse around the comics, um, you know, on the first floor. And, um, I think at the, so I, I just sort of like, that was like the time where I, I discovered, I really discovered comics beyond like superheroes, you know, like up until that point, it was, I was all, all about like X-Men and, um, uh, Batman and stuff like that. And, and like, you know, they're, you know, some of the image stuff, but even like at the point when I was like heavily reading image at that time, image was like heavily like superheroes. Like it was like, it was all spawn and, uh, savage dragon yeah. and stuff like that. Um, so at this point, this would be like kind of like the late nineties. Uh, I just started seeing like all these other types of books. Like, uh, so Warren Ellis was like a huge, um, huge for me, like reading, like I picked up Transmetropolitan and it just like hooked me from like page one. Oh, that's a classic. Um, uh, what else? Uh, Grant Morrison's The Invisibles. Mm. Um, you know, um, I think like those are, and then Mignola's Hellboy. Those are probably like, that's probably like my kind of holy trinity of like, uh, like early influences, like that, that really kind of like made me look at comics like a different way as like something where there was like not only like a writer, but like, like, uh, and this is not to discount the artists at all because the art plays a huge part in it, but I felt like these guys were like authors working in like the comic medium, you know what I mean? As opposed to like writers. And I, I guess kind of like the difference is, is like, you know, I, when, when you say writer, it's like, you know, that, and that, I mean, I'm kind of including like, you know, when you're working on someone else's characters and when you're working on something that's like, um, maybe not necessarily like 100% your own. Whereas like with these guys, I really start, that's when I really started to see, you know, people who were like kind of putting their vision forth. And it felt like, you know, um, kind of like the difference between like, uh, say like, like a big Hollywood movie where you're working with like a studio and like an independent movie, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, I would say like, like Warren Ellis and Grant Morrison and Mike Mignola were like probably like the three, the three big ones for me early on. <clears throat> and like, you know, and I try to like kind of learn as much as I can from like, from those classic books and like all the stuff they've like written since then. Uh, oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I always think, think back to, um, when I was a kid and, and, um, I, someone had shoved 
the Dark Knight Returns into my hands. It's like, you have to mm-hmm. read this, you mm-hmm. know? And I'm like, holy crap, who wrote this? You know, Frank Miller. Right. And like, mm-hmm. so I ran out and, and got his Daredevil run after that, you know, because it was like, yeah, he's doing something completely different with superheroes is, is basically what my take was at the time. And, uh, yeah. and that's when I really realized like, oh, wow, who write it, who writes it is important. Mm-hmm. I mean, even like, like Grant Morrison, like, um, I remember reading, uh, his, his Arkham Asylum book, um, mm-hmm in high school and just being just like blown away by it because it was just so different than like anything else I had seen up to that point, even like, you know, in terms of like the, um, you know, the writing, even the art style, which it's like, it just didn't, you know, it was, it was like a painted book. Like it wasn't, uh, mm-hmm. you know, four color or whatever. Uh, but at the time it was just like, Oh wow, there's this really cool book. And then it wasn't until kind of like later, that I got into Graham Morrison as like a writer that I was like, Oh wait, he wrote that book that I hmm. thought was so awesome. Like five years, you know, 10 years ago, like it, it just sort of like didn't kind of click in my head. Like it was just like another kind of like cool thing. And, um, but yeah, I mean like I had the same kind of thing with like dark Knight returns, Watchmen, like all that, you know, all the classics. <laughs> <laughs> that was the book that made me go, Grant Morrison really is an odd duck, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. He is. He's a wizard. You can't, you know. <laughs> yes. So, uh, him and Alan Moore, they're, they're wizards. And, uh, you know, can't be, can't be a wizard and be, uh, normal. So. <laughs> so, while we're talking about this stuff, I'm, I'm holding a copy of The Wailing Blade number one in my hands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, um, we talked about image before, and I can't help but looking at this gigantic freaking sword, this Liefeldian looking sword. <laughs> and, and I have to say, man, tell us about Wailing Blade. Cause you got, not only do you have Road of Bones coming out this month, but you also have Wailing Blade. So you got a lot of iron yeah. fires, irons in the fire. I could say that, right? Going on right now. Talk about this one for me. All right. Yeah. It's kind of funny how it worked out because I, I, I uh, going in January, I thought it, I thought they were going to be like more spaced out, but it just kind of turned out that the way things worked out, they're both coming out at the same time, which is fun. Um, mm. But anyway, so Wailing Blade is kind of like in a, in a, in certain ways, it couldn't be any more different than Road of the Bones. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a big science fiction fantasy epic. Um, about, um, a, uh, a bandit prince who's trying to save his father from being executed at the hands of basically the Wailing Blade. Um, the head taker. Yes, the head taker. So the story is, is that, uh, like the setting, uh, is we're like thousands and thousands of years in the future where like mankind is kind of uh, had a, a star spanning empire. They've, they've had like, you know, solved every technology that there is. They've brought aliens back and all this stuff has happened. And then that empire collapsed. And this is like thousands of years after that. And there's, and earth has kind of like collapsed into this feudal society, uh, ruled by warlords and tyrants and basically the, the people who can, can control these kind of like last remnants of technology are the ones who are, have the most power in this society. So, um, the guy who rules the region, uh, makes no bones about it, calls himself a tyrant. Uh, he's the tyrant of intern and he has, uh, some executioners that sort of roam the lands, uh, serving justice and, the scariest one of them all is this guy called the head taker who has the wailing blade, which if you look up wailing blade, you'll see he's like kind of got your, he's like this huge like wall of meat with like a skull mask and a blade that is just like, as you said, like Eldian or it's just like gigantic. It's, it's it, like a lot of people compare it to like, uh, something like out of like anime or like final fantasy or something. Um, and this blade is, uh, 
actually wails. Like, you know, like when you use it, it, it like screams. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. Um, it's not intimidating at all. No, not at all. <laughs> um, there's like, it's the sort of thing where like, uh, why does it wail? And we're like, we tell one story in, in the first issue of like, you know, why it might wail or like what some people believe. But one of the things that I thought was, it was like, you know, um, uh, there's that notion that, uh, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke that said it, maybe that, uh, you know, sufficiently advanced technology is like indistinguishable from magic. Mm -hmm. So it's like, like to these people living in the world, it's like, they're like farmers and, uh, you know, peasants and they don't know anything from, from technology. So like to them, it's like, what is, what is that thing doing? It's like, it's screaming. Like, is that like our souls trapped inside of it or, you know, so it's just one of those things that like stories like sort of, uh, pop up around and, and that's one thing I think we kind of like like to play around with in there is that like nobody r really knows like what's going on with it but the story itself is about uh, this guy who's um, he leads like a clan of like bandits and rebels um, his father gets captured and sends to die at the hands of the head taker and uh, Tykin, that's his name, he's, he just can't accept that. So he's like, I'm, I'm gonna rescue my father from the head taker, even though he's, you know, this terrifying thing that everyone tells stories of to like frighten their children. He's gonna take him down and he's gonna rescue his father. But of course, nothing is ever that simple. And that's why we have a four issue comic book. <laughs> um, so yeah, but like I said, it's like where every whereas Road of Bones is like very tight, like small cast of characters, uh takes place in like a fairly recognizable world, like Willing Blade like has a pretty large cast. There's a lot of like the, the story like kind of um operates on a few different levels. There's like Joe Mulvey, the artist on it, designed everything from like the way the cities look all the way down to like the insects and, and the plants like um, you know the trees are like all like weird and twisted and like I, and I talked about that I was like you know like you like went above and beyond with like the set design for this I was like because like if you would just like if I said a forest and you just gave me like a forest with regular looking trees I wouldn't have like I wouldn't have even thought to say like hey Joe these, these trees look too normal like we gotta like make them weird <laughs> But he just kind of went with it, went with this idea that, like, this is, like, thousands and thousands of years in the future and things have evolved and, like, aliens have been brought back and they've intermingled with native life and just, like, things are different. So no no Bob Ross trees, basically. No, no Bob Ross trees. <laughs> what I dig about these two books together is how polar opposite they are. Like, you were just raving about Joe's work, and it's fantastic. Like, Joe has the complete opposite style of Alex. It's, it's a little, and I don't mean this in term insulting at all, it's it's cartoony a little bit. Like, it has mm -hmm. it has more of that feeling to it, where where Alex is like, it's ugly and gritty. This is like, there's tons of, of like, poppy life going on here. And Chris mm -hmm. Sotomayor's colors are just unreal in this book. Like, they give it so much life, and things just pop off the page. Mm -hmm. Like the only through line I see between these two is your sheer knack for violence. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's not all me. That's like, you know, right. That's Alex and Joe's like talents too. Oh, like, um, for sure. But, uh, but yeah, I mean like I like, um, I just like action books and, and like, you know, I think like, one thing that we like, you know, like we do in like action movies and like, you know, like it, it's like, it's like, it's violence and, and it's, you know, sometimes it's like a little bit more cartoony. Sometimes it's a little more like gory and realistic, but like there's, you know, and it's not like I don't have like conversations and, no. and, and quiet moments in my book and my books, but I do like that, like, you know, feeling of like things happen you know fights happen chases happen 
you know, there's like tense moments and then there's relief. And, um, you know, that, that's something that I, I really try to like put across. In no, I think you do. I, I think you do a really good job balancing the big action moments with some quiet character driven emotional stuff. And I think that was kind of something that was actually beaten into our heads from Andy, you know, mm-hmm. pretty early on. And, and like, cause I see a lot of that too in my own work and you know, it's, it's nice to see kind of where the head, where, where it comes from. Um, mm-hmm. like I said, I really like both of these books a lot. John, I think you would absolutely love Wailing Blade. It definitely has that, that fantasy flair that I know you're into, into it. And I think, I think you would really connect with this material. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, anything that has a blade that, you know, might be technological and is called, you know, the Wailing Blade, that's going to be by a guy named the Head Taker. Actually, I have a question. I, mm-hmm. I read somewhere that you said that people would be pretty surprised uh, at you for coming up with a horror title. Mm-hmm. Is it is it true? So why would they be surprised? Yeah. Because historically speaking, um, most science fiction, uh, you know, like you, you, you do sci-fi, most science fiction was like horror because it was usually telling you just how bad things would be in the future if we didn't shape up. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't think- seem like that much of a jump to me. I think, I, I think what I was kind of getting at with that was like kind of looking at like gutter magic and, and, uh, whaling blade. They're both like, uh, I mean, you know, there's whaling blade is more science fiction. Gutter magic is more fantasy, but they're both kind of like books where, um, I think one thing that a lot of people like about them, and I won't say that like everybody likes this but one of the thing that a lot of people have told me was just sort of like um that the worlds feel very expansive you know like um uh i've had people approach me about like doing like, like uh, an rpg like set in gutter magic's world or things like that like I, and i think part of like what i would talk about a lot with gutter magic and when i talk about a lot with willing blade is just sort of like the idea that you know we put a lot of work in both of those books to like making the world kind of like feel alive and expansive. Like with gutter magic, there's like this whole city and I wanted it to feel like, yeah, we're following like one story in this city, but there's like, you know, a hundred other stories that, that are happening at the same time. We just don't have to be following them. And, uh, That's you know, cool. like gutter magic, I wound up doing like a lot of short stories that, only sort of like tangentially touch on the main characters. So, you know, it's just sort of like, um, those worlds feel very big and very lived in and very like, um, again, like, like, you know, not, I don't want to like, um, they're kind of deep, very deep, very deep worlds. And yeah, like, like I say, like, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm bragging because I'm really not, but it's like in the same way that like, like Star Star Wars is like like a saga, and like uh, you know you can uh, and is also big enough to hold all these side stories like the expanded universe or like whatever they're doing nowadays. It's like kind of like that, you know. I don't know if I got there, but that's kind of like what I was shooting for, like that kind of like big, big storytelling, big worlds, big characters, and things like that. Whereas like Road of Bones is very stripped down, very visceral, very like kind of not in a bad way, but like smaller. Like, you know, Road of the Bones, I see myself telling like decades of tales in like the world of Road of Bones of like just, you know, sort of people escaping from different prisons or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh like I think there's certain themes that like in the book that I could explore more or, you know, um uh but I just think it's just like just a very different style from like what people are used to a very different style of storytelling and a very different setting than from like what people are used to from, from me. And I might, I might be wrong. Like, you know, that, that might just be my like, um, uh, insecurity talking because like, you know, maybe I was just sort of like, uh, I don't know if like, you know, like it, it's kind of hard for somebody to like, think like uh oh i love gutter magic let me check this out and you know and then just sort of be like what is this hmm. there's no there's no wizards here there's no you know 
or like somebody like willingly, somebody loves willingly, then they'll pick this up and they'll be like, where's all the tech, you know, (laughs) where's all the aliens or or like stuff like that. So like I said, like it might just be my, like, you know, me like overthinking a little bit, but I just kind of felt like it's kind of like, it felt way different writing it than like what I usually do. And I was just like, you know, I, I, I don't think people will be like negatively surprised. I just think like, you know, people might look at it and just be like, Oh, Rich directed this. Like, you know, that's what's cool. Not really. It really is. Yeah. So, so both books come out this month. Um, where can people find them? Well, they'll be able to find them at finer comic shops. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Road Bones comes out on May 22nd. And when I'm glad it is the following week on May 29th. Um, you know, uh, if you have a comic shop near you, uh, most likely they'll have it. They're more, probably more likely to have, uh, Road of Bones than they are Willing Blade unless, uh, someone, unless people have been specifically asking for Willing Blade. That's just kind of like the, um, just the realities of being with a publisher like IDW versus publisher like Comics Tribe. Comics Tribe doesn't have as big of a reach, so if Willing Blade sounds like it's up your alley, I encourage you to, you know, go go to your comic shop and be like, hey, I want this book. It's in the catalog. They have a number. They'll be able to order it. Uh, But that sort of thing really helps. Um, Road of Bones, you you know, it'll help if you do that too, but I know, like, there's a couple of stores around here where, like, uh, I've gone in to, like, talk to them uh, back when I did Gutter Magic with IDW, and they are like, oh, yeah, if it's an IDW number one, we, we generally order, like, so, and such copies. So I'm just saying it's, like, you're more likely, you'll probably have an easier time finding Road to Bones than finding Willing Blade without doing a little, um, you know, having a little chat with the owner. Mm-hmm. But most, but, you know, probably, like, the big, Bigger comic shops uh, should have both in stock. But if you don't have a comic shop near you and you don't feel like ordering one through a comic shop through the mail, you can get it digitally. They'll both be on Comixology um, same day that um, that they drop uh, in comic stores. And, you know, uh, Wailing Blade and, and uh, Road of Bones, you know, I'm not sure if IDW does direct sales, but I know Comicstrive does. So if you are having a hard time finding Willing Blade, you can go to Comicstrive.com and there will be options to hmm. get physical copies if you prefer uh, reading it in paper and, and digitally. And then, yeah, like those are the first issues. Each each one's four issues. So we'll have a new issue in June, July, August. And then uh, later in the year, we'll have some trades. Cool. <laughs> That's the best thing that people can do to support independent creators, independent works is to actually just going right up to their, their comic shop owner and saying, Hey, mm-hmm. I want to read this book. Can you order it for me? Yes. And yeah. you'll get it. That's the yeah, best yeah. thing you can do. I mean, even if you don't set it up like, uh, you know, you know, like a lot of comic stores have these things called pull boxes where it's like, you know, you have a subscription or something. But even if you don't feel like doing that, if you just tell, tell, you know, whoever works there, just like, hey, you know, this book looks interesting. I, I want to check it out. They'll just make a mental note of it, and you know, they'll they'll be happy to get you a copy. You know, oh, definitely. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll order a few more because you know, maybe other people will be interested in it. And it just kind of really helps. It just really helps support us, um, just as independent creators, because you know, comics are a tough gig. <laughs> See, yeah. uh, so. So, um, so to pivot a little bit, uh, speaking of, of reputations and what people, how people perceive you, um, apparently I'm getting a bit of a, of a reputation on this podcast. So <laughs> go, go on. So, so, you know, obviously last week we reviewed Endgame and, mm-hmm. um, uh, two of our buddies over at So Wizard Podcast, um, because I know Joey that you run the So Wizard, uh, Twitter. Um, they tweeted out about our, our episode. Um, so, <laughs> so, so Joey said, 
Uh, oh, just, all, all he did was retreat it saying, so the boys of Super Tear Speak have their own review of Endgame. Can Dave have a worse take on this than his review of Into the Spider-Verse? Find out here. Yes, wow. yes he can. That's is, he, is he wrong? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my dad. Pretty bold. And then, uh, and then, uh, uh, Mark Ellis, um, who, who, you know, both Joey and, and Mark have been on this show. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> quote, Thor is the comic relief of the movie. Have you seen Thor Ragnarok? The, the score that Dave gives Shazam versus the score that he gives Endgame tells me everything I need to know about his tastes. <laughs> James Cameron is a filmmaking giant, and you should be ashamed for not seeing his big two. Now, wait a minute. Ooh, that I was need, me, actually. I was going to say, <laughs> that was that JD. Me. That wasn't yeah. me. I've seen Avatar. No, that's me. That's right. That was, I'll, I'll, I'll stick up for Dave on that one. That was me who poo pooed uh, Titanic and Avatar. Mm. And my proudness of not seeing either of them. <laughs> I actually haven't seen either one either. So uh-huh. this, is why, this is why I like you, Rich. Like <laughs> I, uh, I, I, it's funny because, like with Titanic, more like, uh, with both of the movies actually. Though, I, I feel like I feel like I have seen them because I've seen so many people talking about them and so many clips and things. And it's like I feel like I don't even really need to watch it because I get it. You know what I mean? Like right. I, I don't. Yeah, we've seen it, even though you haven't seen yeah. it. You've seen it. Exactly. Like I, I, I know, I know, I know. Spoiler alert: the ship sinks in the Titanic. Uh, I know. I know. Uh, I know. Too I know. soon, man. Too soon. Are, are, are we? Are we past the embargo on Titanic spoilers? Yeah, I think uh, I, we might be. Uh, ask, okay. I, uh, ask JD. I mean, he's the one. <laughs> he's the one. I'm good. I'm good, and, man. Uh, yeah, so you know. I don't have anything against them. It's just like poor James Cameron. Like you know, I mean, I love T two and everything, but uh, yeah, they they just don't. They, they didn't like kind of like grab me when they were coming out, and yeah, right. And and, and again, to defend my score for for um, Endgame and JD, you you what? were you're dirty because you get out of what? scoring things anymore. What was your score? For, well, for I gave effect. I gave uh, Shazam a nine, mm-hmm. and my my reasoning for giving Endgame an eight point five is the two things that hurt it for me. It's not a standalone movie. You had to have at least seen Infinity War for this to make any sense. Mm-hmm. And two, Shazam made me feel the way I did when I first saw uh, Superman when I was a kid. And mm-hmm. as much as I loved Endgame and all of the the nods to the comics and, and all the Easter eggs and, and fan service, it's, you know, I didn't get that same feeling from it. All right. I think that's, that's valid. I mean, you know, that's how you felt, right? Right. Like, yeah. Uh, and I, and I love Shazam. Like I took my, I have a 10 year old son and took him to see it. He loved it too. Mm-hmm. And I think it was really, it did have that kind of like magical kind of quality of like, you just like, if you didn't walk out of that movie with like a big smile on your face, it's like you should probably go see a therapist or something because <laughs> it, was, it was just great. Right. Um, I loved Endgame too. Like I thought, I thought it was great. I loved uh, a lot of like the, the payoff of like things that were you know set up like ten years ago and, and stuff like that, but. But yeah, you know, I, I see where you're coming from in that in not being a standalone movie, but then again, it's like I kind of feel like um, <laughs> Is that you, JD? What? On there. That noise. No. No. Oh, okay. then it must be John. So go ahead. No, no, not me. Okay. <laughs> Somebody's doing something. Yeah. Uh, so anyway. Again, <laughs> anyway, I, I just, I don't see how Endgame could have been any other way because yeah. it's like, you know, it, it was just supposed to be just, you know, very kind of like connected. It's Iron uh, Man 22. Yeah. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> it, 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 mm-hmm. In a sense, very much so. Yes. Yeah. But I'll be real. I'll be real, David. I thought you scored that movie a lot higher than I thought you were going to. 
like the way you set it up, I thought for sure you were gonna give it like a seven. So I thought you were more than fair on your rating, even though the So Wizard guys beat you up. <laughs> yes. I mean, like it. 8.5 is not a bad rating. I no. Mean, you know, like, it sounds like you really liked it. You just like Shazam a little bit more, which I, you know, I can see. But so, I will say this. I, I have never heard cheering and clapping the way I did during Endgame. Uh, exactly. Yeah, my theater was like that, too. People and, were, I mean, like, it was packed and people were just going nuts. Like, um... Like, uh, are we allowed to say spoilers or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like, like when Cap picked up Mjolnir, like people were on their feet. I mean, oh, I yeah. almost got on my feet. It was just such like a amazing moment. Like, I, yeah, people like Endgame. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, 2.19 billion. I think mm-hmm. is what they're currently at. Um, is that it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they have, they have, sorry, Titanic fans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they have taken the number two spot and they're, I don't see them not taking the number one spot at this point and beating Avatar, but who knows? Um, yeah, I, people could listen to your review, Dave. <laughs> Oh, sorry. It's not like it's it's not a Spider Verse review. Let's not be too critical. Oh, they didn't like yeah, Spider Verse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dave, Dave is that guy. He's the only guy in America who didn't like Spider Verse. <laughs> uh, I don't like Spider Gwen. So, uh, yeah, that guy. Even though that's probably one of the best renditions of her. No, but no, just, still. I just I don't like the character. Period. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, and, and and I actually have thought about the Thor comment about the you know being a little upset they made him the comedy relief. But I, the more that you, I thought about what you said, JD, where it's like that probably makes the most sense for his character arc, like the whole direction they went. And the fact yeah. that at the end of the movie, he still um, stood up against Thanos, even with everything, you know, it's, yeah, it probably is the best part it of the is, movie. I mean, like, it is, uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Now I, I feel like I've achieved something. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's just so, but he's just so good at comedy. Like, yeah, aren't we great. all in agreement that he's better, that this version of Thor is better than the Kenneth Brana one? Yes. Like, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, steer into the skit. <laughs> yes. There's, there's, I mean, even in the comics, there's always been something kind of like fundamentally like absurd about Thor. Like, you know, it's like, like, uh, you know, speaking like Doth. You know, what is this, like, you know, machine or like, or, you know, like, or, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Just like, like yeah. the whole, like, speaking in, like, the old Viking English why, and, like, you know. Yeah, why a Norse god speaks, like, Shakespeare, what speaks Shakespearean? Never yeah. made sense, but well, it works. <laughs> Thor's, yeah. Thor's the most bizarre character, I think, from the comics. You know, I have a whole run from, it's either from the late 70s or early 80s where, He's going around in space on a spaceship, and it's like, well, wait, I thought he was a god. What does he need a spaceship for? You know, it's just mm-hmm. like weird, strange stuff. You know, I mean, like Beta Ray Bill. Like I was just like going <laughs> yes. through that. Like recently, it's like, oh yeah, okay, it's horse alien Thor for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I, it's a great storyline, but it's just there's just something fundamentally wacky about it. Yeah. <laughs> He's the only oh. Marvel superhero that was turned into a frog. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, yeah, but Thor Frog is awesome. Oh, everything about Thor is awesome. Yeah. I mean, Thor, like, in, in for this movie, like, he really worked for me. I, I thought, I didn't mind him being kind of like the comic relief or like butt of jokes. Like, I, I just, I, there was just something about like, uh, you know, when he kind of like pulled it together and like realized like he was like still worthy and could still like, you know, um, 
still fight Thanos and still like uh, contribute. Like, uh, yeah, I just thought that was pretty awesome. I don't know. And I, I dug, I, I liked Ragnarok too. Like, I thought that was like a really fun movie. I, I enjoyed it a lot more than I enjoyed Dark World for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, That's so. pretty much everybody. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, yeah, I don't know. It, it worked for me. Like, I understand, like, it didn't work for everybody and, and everyone's entitled to to their opinion, but. Right. And, and, and I, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's not going to change my score, but I definitely agree with, uh, with JD's take on it now. Um, but your score, your score is more than fair. So Joey and Markel is taking, taking cheap shots. <laughs> um, so, so the other kind of thing I was wondering if you saw this today, uh, they dropped the trailer for Far From Home, mm-hmm. the new trailer. Yeah. Um, so obviously this is why they, uh, lifted this, uh, spoiler embargo. Yeah. Yeah. On yeah. Endgame. Um, so, they're opening up the multiverse, it appears. Yeah, or are they? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. What it's Mysterio. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, it could be yeah. lying about a lot yeah. of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, it opens so, up a lot of interesting possibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So are, are you excited for Far From Home and, and, and for the possibilities that the multiverse brings? Yeah, I loved Homecoming, and I, I, I have no problem with multiverse stories i think it could be kind of cool it's like it's it's really interesting way for them to go that i don't i don't know if they'll be able to pull it off but i would really like to see them try because it's like you know when you open up like a multiverse it's like you're kind of opening up a lot of uh potentially confusing things like like let's say let's say sam stays Captain America like in you know going forward in all the Avengers movies but they want to tell the story of like uh of what happened when uh the original Cap went back in time right right or like or or I mean like in the in the in the comics he got old too and then got it you know then at a certain point got his youth back so it's like if they you know it's like or, you know, Black Widow is back, but it's not our Black Widow. It's the Black Widow from like two or three universes over. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, it's the sort of, it's the sort of thing where it's like, you know, yeah, like I've, re- I've been reading comics for like 20 years. So like I'm going to be able to follow it probably without a problem as long as they don't completely screw it up. But is like, you know, are we going to be having like, uh, long articles on BuzzFeed about like, you know, like, <laughs> Like, 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 you know, I don't understand what's going. You know, twenty things that don't make sense about yes. Spider Man. Yes, that's home. that's gonna happen. That's <laughs> first, forget <laughs> BuzzFeed. It'll it'll be Reddit. Yeah, but uh, yeah, just, it, it's funny too because like before this trailer came out, I was at my uh, I was at a wedding this weekend, family wedding, and my nephew, who's also a big nerd, we were talking about Endgame, and then he goes. What if the cap at the end, the old man cap at the end, is not our Captain America? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I was like, the oh. split timeline cap, yep. Right. And then I'm like, and that's when I was like, well, they did kind of open the door for multiverse with how yep. they explain time travel in the movie. And then mm-hmm. boom, this movie, this trailer dropped and it's like, okay. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you're excited, Dave. They could have Spider Gwen on now. <laughs> so here's what's interesting about them using Mysterio is Mysterio is the first character in the comics who is able to transverse both the Marvel 616 and the Ultimate Universe. Yes. Because mm. Bendis used him in the Spider-Man miniseries. But at the same time, Quentin Beck's whole gimmick is that he's a special effects artist. He's, you know, mm-hmm. um, an, a liar. Mm-hmm. So this is an interesting way to test out a multiverse, in my opinion. Like, we can test it and see if it works, and if, and they can always say, oh, it's a, the whole thing was a big lie, or they could go right into it. So, mm-hmm. I'm like, the choice of doing it with Mysterio is super intriguing to me, because I think it, I, I think Rich and I both have the same thought, is it could, it really could go in either direction. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, and it, it could even go like where like he's lying about certain things, but then, 
in reality, like, like there's like another truth to it, you know, like, like, you know, like we just don't know, like it's just one trailer, but I think like one thing the multiverse thing does that, that's kind of interesting is like, uh, you know, as far as like the meta stuff about like, you know, the fact that Disney owns Fox now and now mm. they can use the X-Men, they can use the Fantastic Four, things like that going forward. And even though, though they don't have immediate plans for it, it's sort of like, um, you know, they don't all of a sudden they don't need to explain why there haven't been any, like, you know, we're all you mutants when we were fighting Thanos, you know what I mean? They don't have to explain why, like why, uh, the mutants were not there. Maybe they're from another, uh, universe and so, maybe at some point they merge or, or whatever. It just, you know, sort of gives them a lot of like freedom to play around. So, so I had a thought on this too. And, um, one of the things is this is a, this is just a, whacked out theory that I had, but who was the last snap? It was Tony, right? And Tony's whole mm-hmm. thing was he wanted to put a wall around the earth to protect it, you know, a, a, a suit mm-hmm. of armor around the earth, as it were. And he mm-hmm. tried it with the with the robots in Age of Ultron and saw what a mistake that was. Mm-hmm. What if not just destroying, not just killing Thanos with the second snap, but he actually also created mutants with it? possible so that there were more heroes yeah. on the earth to protect it mm-hmm. yeah interesting. I, mean, I don't know it's interesting I mean, that's it, the thing it's like it's all interesting but we're not gonna we're not you know, we won't yeah, know until know until the movie comes out yes so uh <laughs> yeah. it, it, it it's it'll it'll be it'll be a fun <laughs> to watch that's all i know and i will say that i was glad like when the first trailer came out of course they kept minimal uh, minimal spoilers, or there's no spoilers in it, other than, you know, Spider-Man's coming back, right? Yeah, and uh, he's, like, going on vacation and, you know, fighting some dudes. But like, I like the, the yeah. how this trailer shows him dealing with uh, Tony's death and, mm-hmm. you know, this idea of, like, do I have to take over his, his job, you know? Right. So... Mm-hmm. I like that it shows like the world dealing with Tony Stark's death. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. Gonna, that's cool. So, however, I do think it's interesting that it seems like everyone in Peter's school got snapped. Yeah, right, they're all the same age. Yeah. Yes, because no one has seemed to age. The only person that's aged is Cassie uh, Lang. Mm. Yes, so it seems. Yes, so she can be the same age as uh, as the kid from Iron Man Three, but we. <sighs> That might be a theory for another day. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole that's a whole Reddit wormhole. <laughs> yes. Um cool. Well, so, I, I was talking to some people that was just like one kind of interesting thing about like the snap and like the five years later, it's like you know, like uh what happened like if you're in a plane or something, it's like you're gonna like snap back and like mid air or like uh or how- you know, if uh what what happened if, if you got hit by a car at the exact moment the snap happened? So oh. what your body comes back, but you're not alive because technically the snap didn't kill you. It's like <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it's just like or or kind of or funny. you know, again, it, you really can't think about this stuff too much because it's a comic book yeah. movie. But five years, um, half the population on the Earth. Did we stop producing as much food because uh, there was half as many people? Now all of a sudden, you, you, the population doubled. You know, how do you deal or, with the logistics of that? Or even more personally, it's like did your did your wife disappear and like you got over it and you moved on? You married somebody else and then all of a sudden, boom, she's back. It's like that's an awkward conversation. Thanks, Terry. It would depend <laughs> on who her replacement was. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Uh, Ouch. <laughs> But, you know, again, it's like we're, we're comic book fans, so we're like overthinking it and stuff. I think it's just like, uh, you know, like we'll see, we'll see like what they, they, uh, delve into. But I, if we yeah, didn't, I, I, I like the trailer. Mm. Oh, see, so if we didn't overthink things, shows like this wouldn't exist. Yes, mm. exactly. exactly. Um, cool. So, so we're, you know, 
we're a little over an hour now. Um, mm-hmm. so I think it's a, it's a good place to start wrapping it up. And of course, I will ask you the question we always like to wrap up our interviews on. And that is, how do you measure success? Hmm. Kind of tough. Uh, but I will say I don't, I measure success by like, am I, am I happy with the work I've done? You know, Mm -hmm. it's for me, it's less about like, um, is it the number one comic or, you know, or like, uh, people, uh, talking about it or whatever. It's like, you know, like, am I happy with it? If I'm happy with it, I consider it a success. And if, uh, other people are happy with it, then even better. Uh, I think if people are entertained by it, that's like my biggest thing that I would love for people to get out of my work is, um, you know, I don't want you to feel like you picked up a comic by me and like wasted your money. Right. You know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's like, there's like a lot of different things, and uh, you know, sort of like, um, other people, people that like I respect or like, uh, other writers and things like, are they like, you know, uh, reading my stuff and, and saying like, Oh yeah, the, you know, this is great. You know, that's like another factor, but it's like weirdly enough, I, I think like probably like, um, you know, the popularity of it or, or like the financial part of it is probably the smallest part for me. Like as far as like success goes, it's like, it's like, did I do what I set out to do? Did I tell the story I wanted to tell? And like, if I can, if I can say yes to that, then I feel like successful. Cool. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it would be great if I could just write comics and, you know, pay my mortgage and feed my family. That would be, that would be success too. But, you know, mm. <laughs> it's like, maybe we'll get there someday. Maybe we won't. But, uh, you know, for well, me, yeah. As soon as, as, uh, um, Road of Bones comes out, it's going to be huge. And, yeah. you know, they're going to, they're going to pick you up at Marvel and DC. And then they're going to have you write the next Justice League movie. You know, because right. of the horror aspect. Yeah. <laughs> Justice League Dark. There very, you go. Very, dark. Very, <laughs> very, very, very dark. dark. <laughs> I do think you're going to get some attention for, you know, uh, for, for film stuff for Road of Bones because it just seems like a no brainer. For like a, like a, like a, a horror movie. Like, hmm. I do think it's gonna, I do think that's gonna happen eventually. I don't know, maybe, maybe I just get a weird feeling about it, but it just seems, it just seems like a perfect launching point for, um, I don't know about independent, but like a, these, these big, these like Blumhouse lower budget horror movies. Mm-hmm. Like it, it totally feels like that, which I hope it does, because you're my friend. <laughs> well, yeah. I hope, I hope it does too. That would be awesome. Cool. Like, how and- awesome would that be? And then you can hire JD to be a, a staff writer on the. No, I'll be fine just watching my friend succeed. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, and then where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me um, on Twitter and Instagram uh, at rduek. That's uh, R D O U E K. Um, Facebook. Um, I usually promote stuff on uh, facebook.com slash gutter magic. Um, you know, that, cause I started it when I did gutter magic, but I, I just basically talk about, um, like all my stuff there, mm-hmm. but, uh, I'm like most active, most active on Twitter and then like also on Instagram. So I would say, yeah, come follow me at our tweet a lot, you know, I tweet art, I tweet, uh, pages, previews, and, you know, make the occasional joke. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. That's where you can find me. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, I, guys. Ah, no problem. Great time. Yeah. Oh, thanks for doing it. And uh, and uh, uh, the the JD the checks in the mail. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. About time someone pays me for something. Oh uh, wait, wait, wait! You were supposed to pay me to bring them on. Wait, hold on. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think. That's- All right, guys. That's where we'll put a pin it for this week. Um, thanks, Rich, again for being on the show. And as always, boys and girls, thanks for listening. And don't let your cape caught in the door. Have a good week. <laughs>